together. You guys like catching up. You enjoy fellowship. You enjoy having a, a, a bit of time to chat together. Now, that's what we do after church too. There's coffee and tea on uh, the veranda after the service, and uh, you can keep those, those conversations alive and going. It's so good to connect across the generations and with our good friends as we uh, gather for worship today. Hey, um, I, I, I thought we'd uh, just, men- I just mention Haley. Haley's been doing a, uh, an internship uh, down at Burley Heads, and I contacted her this week about doing something in the service today. She said, oh, no, so I'm preaching at Burley Heads Church of Christ today, so <laughs> good on her. So she's been like a youth worker doing an internship, and uh, isn't it great that she's uh, bringing the word right now at another church down the way, so... Oh, um, some, some of you will remember Haley as a little girl. She's really serving the God, God faithfully, as are so many of our young adults, young people here in the life of the church. Um, I want to kick off today with a, with a, with a, with a quote from Stephen Furtick, who, who wrote a book about 10 years ago called Sun Stand Still, as he uh, pondered the, the message that I looked at last Sunday here about, uh, about when Joshua... Uh, prayed and in his prayer basically commanded the sun and the moon to stand still so that he'd have more time to win the battle uh, for the kingdom of God, for, for, uh, for, the, for the Israelites. And uh, surrounded by five kings who had conspired against them as they were seeking to take uh, possession of the promised land, uh, they, they were under the pump. And uh, anyway, what he says is this, faith, we've been talking about faith, audacious faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews chapter 11. It's a well-known verse. And he says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't get any plainer than that. Faith isn't just a get-out-of-hell card. It's the most vital building block of your relationship with God. And it's the only real foundation worth establishing your life on. I like that quote. Some people might see saving faith as pray this prayer of faith as a get out of hell card. As like, you know, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Jesus died on the cross to save me. So I'm going to pray a prayer of faith so that I get out of. But no, this is, it's the building block of the foundation block of our, of our walk with God, of our Christian life. You know, faith uh, is, is, is trusting in the things that we cannot always see um, with, our, with our eyes and feel in, and touch believing the promises of God. It's, it's trusting in what God is going to do. It's believing that he has the power to do more than we ask or think or even imagine. You can't get much plain of that. Now, faith is an essential if we want to get out of hell uh, as well because you know it's through faith and repentance, then um, demonstrated by the obedience of baptism, that we come into a relationship with God and have an assurance of salvation so that we do know that we're going to heaven. But it's more than that. That's what he's saying. It's a building block for a Christian life, for a spiritual life. Having faith, trusting in God. And and, and we all know we're people of faith. And uh, so last week we did, we looked at the story in Joshua chapter 10 uh, about the sun standing still and posed a few questions. And I know from talking to people after, uh, since last Sunday uh, that many people were thinking through these, the answers to these questions in their own lives. How audacious are my prayers? We started these questions that we asked last Sunday. Are our prayers safe and mild and meek? Or do we sometimes pray a prayer for God to do something that's bigger than we can imagine ourselves or that we can do ourselves. Praying those big, bold, audacious, BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals is, is the word used in business sometimes. To pray those big, hairy, audacious prayers to God, to change someone's life, to bring revival, to bring people to salvation to see churches thrive, missionaries successful, praying big, bold prayers, and the prayers in our own lives, to see obstacles removed, to see uh, spiritual growth occurring. How bold are my prayers, or are we praying really safe prayers? Secondly, do I have a clear sense of purpose of what God wants to do through my life? Because when we have a purpose 
And when we, uh, we, can, and we can ask God to, to reveal, to, to, to uh, unfold his purposes in our life uh, as, we, as we read the word. And then the third question was, is there a sun stand still prayer that I need to start praying today? And I think that's a question we're going to finish with again today. Is there a prayer that I need to pray today to bring to God, trusting that he can do what he said he'd do, that he's true to his word, he's faithful to his promise, and he's a big, a mighty, and powerful God who can do more than we even imagine. And I shared last week uh, a, a quote that's always meant so much to me uh, from William Carey, the missionary. Uh, Expect great things from God and attempt great things from God. So walking in faith is trusting in God to do it all, but it's also getting involved in the work of God, and getting off our... Uh, getting, Get putting our faith into action. So today, I'm not just content to want to ask questions and motivate you to have a bigger faith, but to recognize that there is a process for faith development, for faith formation, like a muscle that needs to be built up. And so today's message is about three simple key steps in a process of developing our faith. Those three uh, things are simply here, Speak, do. And I'm going to unpack those three things. Hear, speak, do, as we consider audacious faith. Here's a, a couple of Bible verses to, to kick us off like our Bible reading for today. Starting with Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 and then into James. Thinking, hear, speak, do. Consequently, uh, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the King James Version, but under what I've got there. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing. And then we go to James. But do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And we'll come back uh, to those verses a little later on. So hear, speak, do. Hearing the Word of God, this is the first phase, if you like, the first stage uh, of, of faith development. If our faith is like a muscle that we can build up, I haven't got very big muscles, I'm sorry, you know, but if I want to build up these muscles, I go to the gym and do exercise and it builds it up. Well, hear, speak, do. This is how we build our faith muscle, how we learn to trust God more, how we become faithful believers and followers of Jesus. So basically, hearing the word initiates faith. Hearing the word of God, word of Christ, the message of the gospel, initiates faith. The Christian, Christian uh, way is, is message-centric. You know, you do meet people sometimes who'll say, oh, well, um, you know, wherever you go, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. I sort of say, well, it's just what you do. It's just the way you live. It's, you know, doing good deeds. It's... Uh, but yeah, that's, and that's good. We need, we need both and, you know, because faith without works is, is dead. But it's a message-centric faith. It's all about the gospel. It's about, it's about Jesus. It's about what God has done. God sent Jesus Christ into the world. God's, God himself, God incarnate, came, lived amongst us, taught, did miracles, showed us uh, something of, the, of what God is like, and then went to the cross and took the punishment for, punishment for our sin, that all who believe in Jesus and put their faith in him have eternal life through him, through what Jesus has done, imputed in what Christ has done for us on the cross, dying for us when we believe in him, our sins are laid up, you know, they're, they're, they're gone too. They're crucified with Christ dead and buried, and and we have a new life. It's a message-centric faith. 
And so there's a message to hear. There's a gospel to hear. There's a word to hear. And it's a, it's a, it's a word faith. It's, it's, a, it's about truth. It's about word. And we need to get into the word that when we hear the word of Christ, the gospel first, but then all of the words of God in the scriptures, as we read and study and soak it in and understand it, it transforms and changes. It initiates faith. In Romans chapter 10, we we read that word. The context of that, if you look at the few verses leading up to that, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, it says in verse 13. And then it says, but how can they call on one that they have not believed in? How can they believe of someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? So there's a message to be heard. And how can they preach unless they are sent? And so it's about going out and sharing the message, the truth of Jesus with people because faith begins, comes, is initiated from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The message puts it like this. The point is before you trust, you have to listen. And unless Christ's word is preached, there's nothing to listen to. So hearing the word initiates faith. It's a bit like putting the key into the ignition and turning that key. It initiates it initiates the engine on the car. Unless you've got one of these fancy new cars where you push a button or uh, something like that that doesn't have a key, keyless entry cars and all that sort of thing. But you know, you know what I mean. You put the key in, you turn the ignition, the car is now, the engine's now going. You're not moving anywhere yet. You're not going forward yet. You're not reaching your destination yet. But your faith is initiated. The engine started. Something's happening in the spiritual. Something's happening in your life. Because of the word of God that is initiated faith. It could well be said that when Joshua prayed that bold, audacious prayer for the sun to stand still, he did so because in the previous seasons of his life, he had believed the word of God that was given to him. Right at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1, very well-known words that are spoken to him. Joshua, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous and be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it, the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And because he would, he'd believe those words, he remembered those words, those words that had initiated faith. We saw that Joshua was a man of faith. So that when they went in and, and scouted the land and everybody else said, no, there's no way we can go and take that land. You know, we're like grasshoppers compared to all these warriors. And Joshua and Caleb believed God, they believed that with God with them, that they could take the land, that they could defeat the enemy. And they knew, he knew that God would be with him and give him success wherever he went. The word of God had been planted in Josh, Joshua's heart and mind and life so that when he's facing a battle, he has the audacity to ask God to slow the sun down so that they get more time to win the battle, and so on. The word initiated faith, and so it is for us. If we've believed the gospel, if we've heard the message of the gospel, and we've realized that we're incomplete without God, or that we realize that there are sins and there are regrets and there are struggles in our life that need God to do great work in, and so we receive Christ, we receive the gospel, something's begun, something's initiated. The key has been placed in. The engine is going and you're ready for a life of faith. But it doesn't end with just hearing. It doesn't end with just hearing the word of God. It's interesting, this morning I got a message from uh, one of our elders. Because the elders have been praying. It's good that our elders pray. Uh, in fact, uh, elders are, you know, and, and pastors are, are, are meant to give of themselves to Prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what, the, that's, that's what you know, the Bible talks about. Acts chapter 
6, the apostles said, we need to give our attention to the Word of God and to prayer. And so it's good that they prayed. So one of our elders sent, sent a message that uh, he just said, oh, something I was reading in my Bible yesterday. And so I thought I'd, uh, I thought I'd share with you because it's right on topic. It's right on theme about audacious faith. It's from Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 31 and 32. And it says, my people come to you as they usually do, and they sit before you to hear your words. Isn't that good? My people come to you as they usually do. It's a good habit to come and to hear the word of the Lord. That's why we gather, you know, for, for worship. We want to sing praises to God, sure, and, and share communion together, but we also are looking to meet with God, to hear his word, to learn what his words would say. It sounds really good, Ezekiel chapter 33. My people come to you as they usually do, and they sit before you to hear your words. But then he says, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. And so on and so on. And so it says that they must hear the words and put them into practice. And of course, we'll get to that in a moment. So yeah, sure, something begins when we hear the word. When we share the word, it, 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 it initiates faith. What I want to share today, is that, secondly, is a little bit different. But speaking the word really activates our faith, supercharges our faith. Literally speaking out truths of the gospel, truths of God and God's word, activates our faith even more. Speaking out the words of truth. If hearing is like turning the key in the ignition, then speaking God's word is like putting the car into drive. You're really ready to go. When you've got the car in drive, unless it's a manual and you put it in first gear. But you know what I mean. Yeah, so you know, you've got the ignition in, you've heard the word, now you're speaking the word of God. Interesting verse. Joshua chapter one and verse eight. Followed the, the, the verse that we just read uh, from six and seven where where Joshua is being told, be strong and courageous. Verse eight says, Do not let this book of the Lord oh, sorry, book of the law. Depart from your mind. No. The scripture actually says, do not let that book of the law depart from your memory, your mind, your, your heart maybe. You know, you've got to store the things of God in your... No, it's from your mouth. Do not let the word of God, meditate on the word of God. Don't let it depart from your mouth. I know Paul said to Timothy, do not neglect the public reading of Scripture. Jesus, when he was tempted, spoke out, verbalized to the devil words of Scripture. He spoke it out. So it, and it like activates our faith. It really helps us, I think, when we speak it out loud. There's a number of ways that we can do, that we can do this. We can... Um, read the Bible aloud instead of just uh, reading it silently. It's, reading it silently is great, but read it out loud. Get the Word of God on your lips. When we sing some of our praise songs, we have the praise of the Lord on our lips, on our mouth. We often are declaring biblical, spiritual truths through the songs that we sing. We have the Word of God on our lips. We are not letting the law of God depart from our mouth. A couple of other scriptures too. I just read Joshua 1.8. Um, Psalm 19.41. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. What we say matters. What we say makes a difference. You've only got to look at James. He talks about the power of the tongue to mislead, to misguide. It's, it's like, the, it can, it can really, it, it's like the, uh, the tiller on a boat. It's like the bit on a horse. It's, uh, it, it ha it's like a spark that can start a fire. You know, it's all James says in, 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 his, uh, in his letter. It has power. Our words also have power to build others up. And they have power to speak out the gospel truth to others. They also have the power, I think, to help us in our walk with God to put our faith into action, a step that we often miss is speaking out the word of God. So one way, yeah, I talked about through praise and worship, through reading the Bible aloud. Another way is through scripture memory. 
And then you can call upon that uh, verse that you've stored in your memory and you can speak it out. You can bring it to, uh, to, to your mouth, to your lips when you need to remember those words. And you can preach to yourself. Talking about the mouth, Ephesians chapter 4.29 puts it like this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. You know, sometimes the, the words that come out of our mouth can be harsh toward others, but I'm also concerned that sometimes the words that come out of our mouths can be harsh on ourselves. Amen? Words that sort of put ourselves down. Negative self-talk. I can't do that. I'm no good. I'm useless. I stuffed up. You know, lots of those sort of words that are very negative and self-defeating. And so we can learn to speak positive Bible-based words over our own lives. Preach to ourselves by declaring the truths of God or by recalling Verses that we have memorized. Again, from Stephen Furtick. And I saw a video of Stephen Furtick, who, when, this is some years ago, but when he was going out to preach and how he prayed and prayed out loud before he would go onto the stage, large congregation to preach. And he's declaring scriptures uh, over his life, over the message, praying for himself as he goes out to preach the word to a congregation. And he would have the, he has the, what he calls his 12 audacious faith confessions. So it's like confessing truth, Bible truth, about who, who he is and how he's going to act. These are like um, aspirational statements of who I want to be because of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. First one is, I am fully forgiven and free from all shame and condemnation. And there's all Bible verses for all these. And so when we can say, out loud, I am fully forgiven and free of all shame and condemnation. Because we're so prone to put ourselves down, to condemn ourselves, to feel the weight of our regrets. And then another one, I act in audacious faith to change the world of my generation. I overcome fear and anxiety by trusting in the Lord with all my heart. God is with me. I am able to fulfill the calling God has placed in my life. I am fully resourced to do everything God has called me to do. And so on and so on. He's, he's uh, declaring God's protection, um, it, godly influence in his life as he would seek to preach the word, to preach the gospel. For me, I think I've never, haven't been quite so uh, faithful in declaring audacious faith confessions, but Verses I learned as a young adult, as a youth, have stuck with me and have confessions on my lips that have helped me in many situations in life. And so it might be that uh, they were called the assurances, the five assurances. Navigators Press, I think it was called. And, uh, you know, we had a whole bunch of young people doing a Bible study with, uh, with, a, with a, a, a friend. Um, Paul Ratton, I think, was my group leader back in Caringbar Church of Christ at the time. And uh, we learned, and I learned these verses. And I learned them as a young person. They stay with you. But you can still learn verses when you're not so young as well. Print them out. Put them on your mirror. Put them on the fridge. Put them on your dashboard or something and just repeat them over and over until you get them perfectly right. Our kids often do it with Sunday school, as you know, but we can do it as adults as well. But those verses have meant so much to me. Those times when you doubt whether you're saved or not, whether you, whether you, you sort of, because you've, you know, you've, you've made a mistake or you, you feel like you don't feel God's very close and you get the, the verses are there, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, and this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son of God has life, he who has not the Son of God has not life. And I've written these things to you that you might have eternal life. So verses like that, that since I was a teenager, have just been on my lips for those times. And they're also there to recall when you need to share the gospel with someone. When you feel like you're not forgiven or you need to be forgiven. You know, when you think 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you're facing temptation and you're not sure how you're going to resist temptation. 
God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And these verses on your lips, you can declare them out loud because you've stored them in your heart that you might not sin against him. Answers to prayer. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Speaking the word activates that faith. It's initiated by the word that God gives by hearing it or reading it, but you speak it out and it can have great power. It can help you defeat that negative self-talk. It can help you have victory over the devil in your life as he tries to get you down or trip you up or lead you astray. When you know the word of God and you speak it out, declare it. Or you can put worship music on and declare scripture in song. You know, another way that you can find it, help you gain victory in your life, in your thinking, in your thoughts, rather than listening to music that's destructive, that feeds you with a lot of uh, negative uh, and unhelpful thoughts about life, the world, other temptations. You know, worship music, scripture. Anyone, anyone do that? Put worship on in the car, put worship on in the house. Put it up nice and loud. Sing along. No one's listening except maybe your neighbours secretly wondering what's going on in that house next door. And who cares? Because <laughs> it's the word of God being declared. Okay, so if, uh, if, if hearing the word initiates faith and if speaking out the word of God in your life activates that faith and, and supercharges that faith and strengthens that faith, We've got to get to the third part, which is that doing the word demonstrates faith. And this is where we come to uh, the verse that Steve said to me, sent to me in Ezekiel. Uh, the verses in James chapter 1 and 2, which we'll come to in a moment. Doing the word, being obedient to the word of God, doing something about the things, the, the prayer of faith that you've prayed is really what demonstrates incredible faith. It's a simple message, a simple thought. Do not merely listen to the word. Uh, sorry, um, James 2.17. Faith if itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. We talk about audacious faith. It's great to have faith, but you've got to do something with it. You've got to pray that prayer. Trust God to come through and then step out and be obedient to the word of God to demonstrate the faith that's in your heart. That way, you're putting the foot on the accelerator, you've got the key in the ignition, you've got the car in drive, and when you obey, obey the Word of God, when you put into practice the things that you've heard and spoken, then you're really moving forward in your faith life. James 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the Word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We all know that's the hard part. But being obedient, to trust and obey, it's, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. And, he said, and as we read in our Bible reading, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks in the mirror and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of foolishness. So he says, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in all he does. James 1, 23 to uh, 25. Don't merely listen but do what it says. And again, from, uh, from Stephen Furtick, the senior pastor of Elevation Church, he, he, he put it like this, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. His words here. So it's possible for us to hear God's word, take notes, memorize scripture, and then to speak God's word out loudly until everyone thinks we're smoking crack. You never walk and you'll never walk in truly faith because it's not really faith until we do it. Authentic faith doesn't end in a positive mental state. 
it plays out in total obedience based on the sure and certain word of God. And so if we really want to live a life of faith, if we want to step out and see God do great things in and through us personally, in our families, in our church, in our nation, we need to hear, speak, and do, obey, put into practice the word of God. Peter, walking on the water, I mean, he saw Jesus coming toward him on the water when he was in that boat. And I guess he, he could have thought through all of the implications of what, it might, what might happen if he used to step out of the boat, but he actually stepped out on that water and walked toward Jesus and, until he, and, and actually did until he dropped his eyes to the waters around him and got really worried <laughs> and uh, started to sink and Jesus lifted him up. But he actually put his life on the line by stepping out of that boat into troubled waters, believing by faith that God could allow him to walk on that water just like Jesus was doing. He had to go beyond just hearing it, speaking it, thinking it, but to actually take that big step, take that step of faith. Warren Wearsby, the Bible commentator, says, True faith is based on what God says and it is demonstrated in what we do. I'll read that one again. True faith is based on what God says and is demonstrated in what we do. People with faith do things for God and God does things for them. So if we want to build a life of faith, let us be a people who hear the word, who speak the word, and who do the word of God, who obey the word of God, that we would initiate, activate, and demonstrate a vibrant, vital faith in the living God as revealed through Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask uh, some of our band to get ready to lead our final song. Well, actually, that's me. Um, but anyway, if the keyboard player could just play some quiet music in the background. Well, no, no, it's a bit hard. Just want us to finish with a prayer. I want to invite you to stand. Last week we asked that prayer. Is there a God? Is there a sun stand still prayer that you need to pray? And some of you said yes to me afterwards. Yes, there's a sun stand still prayer that I'm praying. It might be a family member. It might be some issue in your life. It might be a health issue. It might be a family issue. It might be a church issue. It might be something that's on your heart that you need to do and feel God's leading you to do. I just want to give you an opportunity as we finish this service just to bring your personal sun stand still prayer to God. And then we're going to sing a song about speaking the name of Jesus and speaking the truth of the gospel of Jesus uh, throughout our lives as we finish the service today. So let me just give you a moment. Just to take that moment as you stand right now in the presence of God. He is here. He's promised that when two or three are gathered in his name, he is here in our midst. He is reaching out to you. As we sang earlier, with, with strength and with hope and with truth, he's reached out to you through Jesus. And he's here and he's waiting to hear your prayer, your heart's desire, your heart need. Your son stands still prayer. Would you bring that to the Lord right now? It might seem a small prayer to you. But it's important to our God and Savior who loves you with an everlasting love and knows you intimately. And so, Lord, we bring combined prayers to you of a hundred or so people gathered here today. Prayers for people, prayers for difficult situations, prayers that need miracles, that need your hand to be at work. And we bring these prayers to you with faith, trusting in the promises of God, believing that you are able to do more than you ask or think or e than we ask or think or even imagine. Believing that you care 
that you are a good and a great and a powerful God. And so, Lord, we humbly bring these audacious prayers before you. We pray, Lord, audacious prayers for Springwood, for our church and our community. Lord, strengthen your church. Strengthen us with commitment to one another. Lord, with commitment to the mission that is before us. Give us hearts that reach out to others and and help us to go and do that reaching out. Lord, fill us with uh, your power, your energy, your wisdom, that we might be effective as a local church. See dozens of people every year coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, coming to a place of baptism and full surrender and commitment, sending people into service and ministry in all different methods and forms. Lord, we pray these prayers for our church. In addition to the prayers for each of the lives that have been brought to you, Lord, in these moments this morning. Lord, may we be a people who hear, who speak, and who do the word of God in our own personal lives and as a local church community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's sing.